So, Peter Switch, I, as your judge, jury, and executioner, have proven your foul heresy beyond all doubt. Guards, burn him. <laughs> Never fear, Reverend. <laughs> My eagle, Lucifer, has the mightiest talons of any bird in the country. Then let him be set forth at once. <laughs> Lucifer, kill! <laughs> <laughs> See, we shall find plenty of wigs in this village. See, even the houses are wearing them. <laughs> oh no, the picture is... This man is wearing a toupee. Proceed with the test. <laughs> oh, no, no! No, no, no! No!
fear not. My other eagle has almost such a as the first, but not quite. <laughs> Cromwell, kill! And I... <laughs> Big Finder General, by any standards, one of the most remarkable films ever to come out of the Hammer Studios, and probably the most popular <laughs> picture that Lottie Straitman never made. In fact, during her career as a Hollywood actress, Miss Straitman didn't make a total of 23,941 films, <laughs> many of which undoubtedly owe their vast appeal to the fact that she wasn't in them. People have accused me of sleeping with every top movie executive in Hollywood, which just isn't true. In fact, I managed to stay awake with nearly all of them. <laughs> Lottie Straitman was born Lawrence Manny Straitenstein in this small, dirty, tumble-down old photograph of Krakow in 1911. The parents had been in show business themselves since 1863 as archaeologists working on the excavation of gags for the Benny Hill show. <laughs> and so Lottie was, as they say, born in a trunk. In fact, because her parents were strict Orthodox Jews, she wasn't allowed out of the trunk until she was nearly 23 years old. <laughs> her first husband, Mel Falsnose, recalls. When I married Lottie in 1929, she was still permanently in the trunk. This placed quite a strain on our marriage, not to say the bed. Did she ever come out of the trunk? Uh, not until her fifth picture with Warner Brothers. All her early parts she played in the trunk. And she insisted on only opening the lid if it was essential to the plot. <laughs> One of Lottie Straitman's earliest screen appearances was in the multi-million dollar epic Son of the Maltese Falcon. <laughs> Barney Smoth. I, I have an appointment with the board of Universal Pictures. It's about the new Frankenstein horror movie. They want to see my designs for the monster. Oh, yes, they're expecting you. Go straight in. <laughs> ah, Barney, come in, come in. We've all been looking forward to meeting you. Oh, my God. <laughs> Close the door. Take a seat. Make yourself at home. I'm Walter J. Schmerton, chairman of the board. And this is J.J. Herman J. Metzarelliheimer, head of production. And this is J.J., 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 J., Mary, J.J., J., Rosenstern, J., head of stupid American initials. And we're pleased to meet you. Oh, hi there. So, now you've got the designs for this hideous monster that's going to terrify audiences all over the world, have you? Well, I... Uh... Hey, now, don't let's rush the man. Perhaps he'd like a drink first, hmm? Please, a big one. Fine. <laughs> oh, my God. Excuse the leg. An old war wound. Well, well, well. So you're Hollywood's top horror artist. Oh, I wouldn't say that. Oh, now you mustn't be modest, Mr. Smoth. Why, you did design the blob from outer space, the thing from the green slime, and Shirley Temple. <laughs> I, I, I don't really think that I'm... Anyone got a light? Ah, here we are, boys. There, there we are. There, 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 there. Thank you very much. As hey. a matter of fact... Hey, look out! Oh, it's close. You nearly set fire to your designs there by mistake. I did. Uh, how stupid of me. Oh, well, if that's all, I think I'll be getting back now. Oh, I think I want to die. Well, I'm sure we're all looking forward to seeing these designs. My, my, stuffy in here, isn't it? Would you mind if I just open the window a moment just to get a little fresh air? Oh, oh dear. I got and dropped the designs out all the way out of the window by mistake. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> That's all right. I'll get them for you. <laughs> Here we are. Oh, you come and 
sit down, Bart. There, now we can have a good look see. You don't want to look at those. They're really not horrific at all, and they're totally unscary. <laughs> oh dear, look what I've just gone and done. I gone and torn it all to pieces. Oh well, never mind. <laughs> Sensational! It's a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece, you're right. It's Look. terrifying. In 1936, when she'd come out of the trunk, Lottie divorced her first husband on the grounds of marriage. <laughs> her second husband was female impersonator and part-time Liberace, Ron Quite Butch, really. I shall never forget when Lottie was expecting our first child. She told me she didn't mind whether it was a boy or a girl. And of course, that's exactly what it was. As her movie career developed, so too did her reputation as a man chaser. And her infidelity reached a peak in August 1938, when her 27th husband was granted a divorce after citing the crowd scene in Ben-Hur as correspondent. <laughs> it was during this period that she did some of her most famous work. Here she is, playing the end of a commercial break. <laughs> Japan, inscrutable center of the Orient. A nation of refinement, delicacy, and daintiness. <laughs> well, a quarter of a century ago, latter-day samurai warriors flew to certain death for the honor of their homeland. A lot has changed since then, of course, but one thing we promise will never change. Today, as always, you can be sure of a class reliable service aboard Kamikaze Airways. <laughs> Every day, we fly up to 25 jumbo suicide missions around the world to the American aircraft carrier of your choice. Guaranteed personal annihilation and an utterly futile gesture of loyalty to the Divine Emperor are among the hallmarks that make Kamikaze Airways the world's number one. Ask for details at your local undertakers now. That's all we've got time for this evening, I'm afraid. <laughs> we were hoping to get an extension until three o'clock in the morning, but we've just heard that London Weekend are broadcasting a special edition of the epilogue about how Margaret Thatcher has decided to become a nun. <laughs> to opt for total humility and become a mother extremely superior. <laughs> That's followed by three hours of blank flickering screen and then an episode of soap, which will be cancelled. <laughs> so from me now, good night. <laughs> Doctor, I've been trying to cut down. Oh, yes, not a success. Now, what yes. Just one of hundreds of middle-aged men in Britain today who are becoming grossly over-frost. <laughs> it's a condition that many people would rather not talk about. But here at Frost Watchers, dedicated therapists work continually to help those suffering from the effects of hyperfrostia, or, as it's more commonly known, obesity. <laughs> Dr. Blinney's dummy microphone, how yes. serious is the problem? Well, of course, uh, 
Most people probably have a bit of surplus frost about their bodies, a clipboard, say, or a set of bathroom tiles in place of their front teeth. But I don't think the public realises that in severe cases, being over frost can lead to more serious things, obscurity, death, and eventually Yorkshire television. <laughs> what exactly are the first symptoms? Well, in its earliest stages, the only real way to detect a case of frost is by careful examination of the patient's caption. Uh, now, let, now, let me show you what I mean by that. Um, what's your name, sir? Um, Percival Higgs. Percival Higgs. And that, uh, could you just show us your caption, please? Mm-hmm, that's right. Ah, now, there you are. <laughs> this, you can just see the first signs of frost beginning to appear there. there. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Uh, Doctor, uh, that patient over there, he's obviously a more advanced case. Oh, yes. Now, this gentleman here has put on a lot of frost around his head here and his shoulders up here yes. and around his wrist mm -hmm. here and his hand just here. <laughs> and, of course, none of this is very good for you, as you can see from this man's X-ray. Now, here you can see a massive increase in the size of the wallet. <laughs> it's become, become badly swollen with what we call paradigm subsidiary complications. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me, what are the chances of a complete recovery? Well, this was one of the worst cases that we ever had come to us here for our health. <laughs> but after only five months with us here at Frost Watchers, we have succeeded in helping this man to get rid of nearly every scrap of talent Charisma, energy, and general expertise. And look at him now. <laughs> must have very encouraging, Doctor. Oh, what about that one there? Ah, uh, well, now, here you are. You see the first symptoms just starting to show. The bags under the eyes, the visiting America a lot to do interviews with celebrities. In 1941, Lottie married her 30th husband, Dr. Billy Thrimson, evangelist and former hitman for the Pilgrim Fathers. <laughs> this marriage, like all the others, wasn't to last. At that time, I was very upset by the death of my good friend, Gary Cooper, which, as you know, was hushed up until after he'd finished his last three pictures for MGM. <laughs> and then, of course, came that awful communist business. Although she was non-political to the extent of sending donations to the Republican Party, Lottie was accused in 1943 of anti-American activities. Allegations of hoarding communist insignia were rife after the discovery one night of red buttons among her underwear. <laughs> Despite her own and Mr. Button's repeated denials, the communist witch hunt continued well into 1944. Of course, the, the whole notion that Lottie was a commie was utterly absurd. Why, I remember when I first met her in Baltimore, I asked her what life was like in America. She said, uh, well, you know, can't complain. I said, ah, same as Russia then. <laughs> Following her divorce in 1946 from failed actress Roy Rogers, Lottie met and married Captain Terrific, a cartoon character working on short one realists for the treatment of afternoon sunlax in Britain. But close friends could see it was never meant to last. She was the glamorous, wealthy movie actress with a passion for the high life, and he was just a line drawing in Indian ink on a sheet of celluloid. <laughs> it was arranged that, to help the marriage, Captain Terrific's animator, Ub Kransky, should always be on hand to draw her husband in whichever position Lottie desired. <laughs> a plan which came to an abrupt end on the first night of their honeymoon when he ran out of ink. <laughs> During their short marriage, however, Lottie and Terrific did make one film together, Terrific appearing this time as the new screen hero, Cheapo Cartoon Man. At the headquarters of the sinister doctor voiceover acting. Curse, cheap old cartoon man. Thanks to him, I must spend my life in this wheelchair, thus avoiding the need for my legs to be animated. <laughs> I'll show him I mean business. and made us run past the same place over and over again to make it look like us. 
bunch of people panicking. Call for Cheapo Cartoon Man. Cheapo Cartoon Man! <laughs> Meanwhile, at the apartment of Meek Mile Clark, not Cheapo Cartoon Man. This is a job for Cheapo Cartoon Man, Gloria. What can we do? Nothing. All you ever do is stand there and blink your eyes up and down, the same as I do. It's hopeless. That's what she thinks. <laughs> Look, over there. Where? Cheap old cartoon man. But a moment ago, when I was exactly the same drawing, only turned over on the other side, I was drawing the door. Uh, Clark had to rush off, I'm afraid. Now then, to work. Has there been a delivery for me from the Acme Standard Lamp Company? Why, yes, there they are. 400 of them, all totally identical. Good. Fortunately for us, this room is only six feet wide, but 7,000 yards long. Now then, Gloria, while I stand with my head at a dramatic angle like this to make my motionless body look more interesting, you will position all the standard lamps ten feet apart all the way down the room. Hurry! Right, here we go! I'll soon catch that evil villain now. <laughs> Extremely long, thin room. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? It's impossible to tell with our animators. <laughs> it was here, in this cemetery in Boston, Massachusetts, that Lottie Straitman was buried in 1964. It's been said that critics of the cinema never had a good word for Miss Straitman. In fact, they had a lot of good words, but we're not allowed to use them on television. <laughs> However, of all the great movie actresses who've played their part in building up the legend that today is Hollywood, I think I can safely say that Lottie Straitman was the worst. <laughs> You're watching BBC One. <laughs> and now it's time for more sophisticated fun with the staff of Grace Brothers in Are You Being Stereotyped? <laughs> Ground floor, poofters, always taking inside the <laughs> <laughs> 